The Checkpoint is presented by GM Pharma, the first international multinational pharmaceutical company in Georgia. GM Pharma, to serve those who need it most. Minister of Health Ekaterina Tikaradze resigned. She thanked the medical sector and staff at a special briefing and spoke about the projects implemented during her ministry. Of course, the main challenge and target of action was to fight the pandemic. The minister has implemented a number of important projects that affect the well-being of our citizens in terms of social as well as health and labor, and this is a great achievement for us, she said. According to her, she will continue working in a Georgian dream in a political council. The Monetary Policy Committee of the National Bank of Georgia decided to increase the refinancing rate by 0.5 percentage points. The monetary policy rate is 10.5 percent now. The National Bank of Georgia will ban 15 years mortgage loans in foreign currency and their term should be reduced to 10 years. These changes will take effect from next year. According to the President of the National Bank of Georgia, Kobak Venetadze, the new program of the International Monetary Fund doesn't provide additional funds. During the previous program, the Georgian government borrowed funds from the International Monetary Fund to finance the budget deficit as well as to refill the foreign exchange reserves of the National Bank. If the IMF program is launched, it will not provide additional funds, said Kobak Venetadze. The government of Georgia submitted an updated draft budget for 2022. The revised version of the budget provides an increase of expenditures, namely the government's budget spending will increase by 332 million jobs. Due to the predicted economic growth of 6%, Georgia's GDP is expected to reach 65 billion jobs. The deficit will be 4.2% and the debt volume will be 51.1% of GDP. In October 2021, the number of sold residential properties amounted to about 3,300 units, which is 2% lower than its pre-pandemic level. In January, October 2021, the total number of transactions exceeded its 2,019 years level by 1%, according to TBC Capital Report. One week ago, the first regular cargo train left the Chinese city of Wuhan to Georgia, according to the Georgian Embassy to China. It's important that such cargo transportations from China by railroad will become regular not only in the direction of Georgia, but other European countries too. You are watching The Checkpoints. I'm David Jalagoni and BMG is ready to tell you more about business and economics. Foreign direct investments in Georgia amounted to $299 million in third quarter of 2021, up 1.4% from the adjusted data of the same period of last year, reports the National Statistics Office of Georgia. Increasing reinvestment is considered to be the main reason for the growth of FDI. The United Kingdom was a major foreign direct investor country, Netherlands was the second, followed by Czech Republic, the largest share of FDI was registered in the financial sector. The energy sector was the second, followed by the manufacturing. Investment environment of Georgia is the main topic of our program today, and regarding this, we have the latest news and interviews. Foreign policy and the newly funded American Georgian Economic Cooperation Foundation held a joint international event last week. The chairman of board is former Georgian Prime Minister Mamuka Bakhtadze. This fund was established in August 2021. According to Mamuka Bakhtadze, the organization aims to facilitate the opening of a regional office of U.S.-based Development Finance Corporation in Tbilisi and the signing of a free trade agreement between the United States and Georgia. The American companies um, have a lack of financial and economic tools to compete with Asian companies and uh, Russian companies. Uh, so basically, this was a reason, and also uh, that was also one of the ma my major goal as a prime minister of Georgia to take 
the strategic partnership between US and Georgia to another level through economic cooperation. Uh, because I, I clearly see that without a solid economic foundation, it will be extremely difficult to have a sustainable uh, high level political uh, relations because the weakness in the economic cooperation will be always used by negative forces to undermine the aspiration of uh, of the small countries, in this case of Georgia, and our aspirations to become uh, part of uh, EU and NATO. So therefore, I think that the economic dimension in our cooperation uh, should be uh, should be key. And I think that uh, the current situation, although it is full of challenges, that may really open up some uh, possibilities in this respect as well. And so that was a major uh, motivation for me and for my American friends and Georgian friends to start this organization. As you know, um, the region has faced significant instability over the last year. Um, and we have very much uh, uh, tried to be a steady and engaged partner with the, uh, the countries of the South Caucasus and that we really strive to help the, the countries of the region find long-term peace, stability, demo democracy, and prosperity. We absolutely support greater democratic security and economic resiliency, um, both at the regional level and in our broader bilateral relationship. Um, our overall approach is a regional one that aims to foster peaceful settlement of existing conflicts and enable opportunities for the three South Caucasus countries to cooperate and achieve positive outcomes together. Um, we want to strengthen these lo our long-standing relationships and increase engagement in the region, as I said, at the request of our partners there. I think it's important we strongly support Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia's efforts to build this regional relationship independently and in the best interests of the countries of the South Caucasus themselves. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I uh, made clear in all three uh, capitals while I was there um, is the role that the United States wants to play in a transparent fashion of being an honest broker to bring the countries together to have these conversations um, themselves. As far as Georgia is streaming to sign a free trade agreement with the United States, it's the right time to listen to Matt Kennedy, the founder of Coverage. This company is working on investment projects, not only in the United States, but also worldwide. He is also a member of the Georgian-American Economic Cooperation Fund. Georgi Sakadze sat down for an interview with this investor. Take a look. Matt, thank you so much for your time. So such quick response. I appreciate all the contacts between us already. They, uh, they work just fantastic and you've been so much responsive. Thank you for your time. Uh, it's great to be here. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, Matt, brief us about yourself, about your current uh, occupation. We are much uh, aware, maybe personally myself, while in the preparation uh, with interview with you, about Converge itself, about your team, but what you guys doing, what's your occupation so far? Yeah, great. So, you know, so I, after I left uh, working for the federal government here in, in the United States, I founded Converge. Um, Converge is a uh, investment and development company focused on um, infrastructure and other sort of asset heavy operating businesses. Um, and so we work both in the United States and globally um, and have a particular interest, um, you know, in the, you know, potentially in the Caucasus area and exploring opportunities here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can we consider that uh, or can we evaluate sort of investment portfolio coming from Converge or yeah. it just priorities or things like that? Yeah, yeah. so we have, you know, we have existing uh, investments in sort of infrastructure, um, as I mentioned, some utilities, water, wastewater, um, you know, real estate, particularly housing um, and some renewable energy assets as well. Um, as we sort of look ahead, I think we're you know we're very much focused on industries that are going to benefit from sort of the, the larger transition to more of a circular economy and an economy where there's you know a price to carbon. So we're you know focused right. on ways to value um, opportunities, renewable fuels, um, things like that that I think that you're going to see over the next you know five, ten years significant um, growth in those. So uh, you know, Converge is a little different than some other funds where we're 
know, really focused on, on long-term asset ownership um, and holdings. So, um, you know, really look for opportunities that have um, some significant duration to them and not afraid, not afraid to, to hold assets for a long period of time. Yeah, that definitely within the plans and geography of this portfolio coming from Converge, Georgia is covered. Am I right? Yeah, so we're, we're looking to get into it. We don't have anything yet, but I think we're, uh, we'd love to get some. So we have uh, get something in the area and in Georgia. So we're, we're looking to do that. So uh, me as well as also, well, it's been a old period, like maybe already tw tw almost 20 years ago, but also as a part of admin current administration. I mean, in Georgia, okay. I know that it's uh, rather complicated to... Uh, transform the answer on my following question, but I'm really interested how it's going in US in this pandemic period. Unfortunately, I cannot call it post-pandemic yet because it's no. still, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's turmoiling and everything is still quite uncertain. But at the same time, there have been various steps taken in the fields of economic uh, recovery plan and uh, uh, President Biden team was quite active in these regards. Uh, how do you personally uh, evaluate what, what what's your story about uh, the situation within the investment climate climate in U.S. Uh, so here in the United States, I think the investment climate's uh, pretty strong. I mean, I think you see strong growth um, and a lot of opportunity. I think that's only going to be. Um, you know, heightened and accelerated through, you know, the recovery plan put forth by by President Biden. I really think that that, you know, is a generational type of opportunity um, that's really going to, to, you know, help lay the foundation for to continue U.S. competitiveness as we um, move forward um, in the years to come. You know, a lot of that, so much of that um, pandemic response is focused on you know, repairing assets and infrastructure that, you know, is needed here, but also investing in the industries of the future, um, you know, that you see coming down the pipeline. So, you know, electrification of the grid and, uh, and you know, the transportation industry. The final support plan was dedicated to infrastructure uh, projects. Am I right? Primarily. So the, the first chunk of it, you know what I mean? I think we still have some work to go. Um, mm -hmm. And I think President Biden's right to continue to to push on the, on the next phase of that. Um, but yeah, the, the first piece has been very much focused on on infrastructure um, and you know assets here in the United States. Correct. Uh, Matt, uh, how ongoing pandemic uh, turmoil uh, reflects on U.S. external policy and at the same time supporting their strategic allies? Um, so let, let me first say, I think, you know, the United States and, and in particular, I think President Biden has, has made it clear that, you know, we as a whole recognize that, you know, the pandemic is a global problem. Um, and that until the world um, and the entire world is vaccinated, you know, there's risks, um, you know, to the U.S. economy and, U, and U.S. citizens. And I think, so that's why the U.S. has taken a leadership position in, you know, vaccine diplomacy, the COVAX program with the U.N., those sorts of things. You know, oh, the U.S. wants to be part of the solution um, for the world and is a like, leading the way. Okay. Uh, Matt, okay, go to, let's move back to Georgia at the yeah. same time. How well do you know our country, uh, especially our region, I mean, South Caucasus and uh, uh, just tell us a story how you first time getting gay with Georgia. How was your intro to Georgia? How and with whom it has happened? Yeah, so, you know, I'd say I've always been intrigued by sort of the South Caucasus region um, and what the opportunities there could be. I have some personal friends here in the United States that, you know, are from Georgia um, that have always piqued my interest. I had, you know, so I'll say I'm, you know, familiar with it and wanted to become more familiar. I, my, my first opportunity to visit Georgia happened earlier this year. Um, you know, you know, we came to Toomey um, for the opening of a new term, a new fertilizer terminal. Um, it was a joint venture between a great American company, Tramo, uh, and a great Georgian company, Wonderland, to really help bring, um, you know, fertilizer from from the region and access sort of the developed markets around the world. You know, in that, in that case, particularly the EU. Um, you know, and I think um, you know, look forward to continuing to to get engaged. 
Okay, very good. And how do you see the role and perspectives? How well do you know uh, Georgia in this regards? At the same time, while pointing Tramo and Wonderland at local Georgian one, which is, uh, I agree, fully doing great job here in this country. Uh, at the same time, how do you see perspectives of our country within the region? Uh, well, and uh, at the same time, uh, I'm very much interested while you are following, as mentioned, the South Caucasus uh, things, uh, how do this see the role of Georgia after this uh, uh, things has happened in our region last uh, October, November. I mean, Karabakh war and etc. Yeah, well, so I guess you know my, my view is that you know Georgia has a unique um, a unique position and a unique role to play if um, you know if Georgia wants to you know as a, as a neighbor um, to sort of the Karabakh war you know those countries involved there it has a unique understanding sort of of the conflict and I think Georgia if it wants could play and if it's asked could play sort of a mediator. Um, in that process. Um, you know, I think that it also highlights ha that Georgia, as you look for sort of where, you know, sort of a, a, a base for private investment into the region, um, that Georgia has that unique place because it's in some ways, you know, it's the most stable uh, country in the region. Um, and as a friend of the United States and as a close ally, you know, from a private sector standpoint, offers that stability. Um, you know, that, that is needed to, to move forward and make sort of long-term investments. Matt, taking into consideration uh, your first engagement, Georgia's, I'm not talking about, you know, the story of Tramo and Wondernet here, uh, which spheres uh, or industries uh, do you consider for Georgia as the most attractive for potential U.S. investment? Taking into consideration that you pointed and highlight the potential of our country to become a really hub for the region uh, covering various directions. Yeah, so I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in a lot of industries, but I think when you really focus on on what the, the near-term piece is there, I think you know the great advantage Georgia has is sort of the access to the Black Sea. Um, and so I think you see there's lots of opportunities around transportation and logistics and the infrastructure associated with that. I think there's also... Um, some opportunities around sort of, you know, electricity and green, green energy, um, you know, but these are big projects um, that require, you know, big investments um, and, you know, essentially long term paybacks. And I think that's why, you know, we need to look forward and Georgia needs to find some solutions to bring that investment and, you know, make those projects um, for the, as the private sector is more and more involved, you know, a little less risky and find ways to partner, not just with the private sector, but also utilize um, some of the tools and toolkits that, you know, really governments, both, you know, the United States and European governments and others um, can help provide. Uh, Matt, uh, DFC in Georgia, how realistic uh, this plan is uh, from your perspective? Um, so I think it's a realistic plan. I think the you know, the, the private sector needs, um, you know, to really move forward, I think does need a, some, you know, an institution like DFC to become more involved. Um, and I think, as I said, Georgia is the, the right place for that, um, that office, you know, as you think about the region, you know what I mean, and the right place to cover it because of its stability. So I think, um, you know, I think it's, you know, a, re a reasonable thing and something that um, is, you know, an interesting idea to move forward with. Uh, and at the same time, AGC fee, uh, yeah. I think I'm right in spelling. Uh, I just learned about this organization just a few days ago. At the same time, uh, uh, very impressive board representatives on it, quite well known for Georgian uh, Georgians as well here. Uh, why and by whom was this organization formed? Uh, because you are part of it as a board member. And uh, if I can be uh, helpful, how, uh, how, how it can create some efficient role in the further aims like pointing that uh, America Georgia Economic Cooperation Foundation is for and to facilitate execution of FTA between USA and Georgia, and what we just pointed, establishment of DFC office in Georgia covering whole region. 
go ahead. Yeah, well, so thank you. I, so first off, I think you know a few individuals in Georgia established established the NGO to facilitate uh, you know greater collaboration between the U.S. and Georgian private sectors. Um, and you know, I think that you know that allows for successful integration um, of Georgia and the region into the global economy. Um, also to bring our higher labor rights and protection standards uh, and high ESG standards to the economy. I think you know, together we'll also bring innovations and modern technologies uh, and, they're all, and also you know, together with that, a high rate of human capital development. Um, that should result then in the support, the, the creation of a, of a strong middle class. Um, and we'll also, I think, to, to accomplish all of that, you know, need the rule of law and the consolidation of democracy to move forward. So I think, you know, to me, there's the explicit, there's some explicit purposes, but there's a broader context of economic cooperation uh, and goals that will have lasting benefits to, you know, to the Georgian economy and to the Georgian people. At the same time, while pointing uh, the potential having DFC in Georgia covering the whole region, I really want to have additional uh, explanations personally from you about the potentials and realistic having FTA between USA and Georgia, please. Um, so listen, I think it's a real possibility. Um, you know, I think the re you know, as we discussed a little bit earlier, you know, the region is, you know, in flux um, a bit and, you know, um, but and my my belief on all of this is, you know, an FTA would be very beneficial to the region and to Georgia, um, you know, and that nothing difficult um, happens without, you know, trying. And I'm you know a firm believer that, you know, to accomplish anything great and anything significant, you know, it, it takes a lot of effort and a lot, you know, and it's better to try um, and fail than to never try at all. And I think that, you know, this is an opportunity um uh, you know, spearheaded by Mamuka Bakese, that I think really um, everyone in Georgia and the region should sort of help get behind because I think it um, has the ability to to create you know a lasting benefit to the uh, to the country and to the region. Matt, uh, thank you so much. My final question is uh, due to the good contacts uh, introduced me to yourself and thank you again so much for this interview. Uh, all the local community and our business society will be much interested in about your surname, Kennedy, that you're representing this famous family. So I do have understanding with whom I am talking to right now, but please brief us about your family and your personal engagement with this uh, uh with this uh, name and with this family, please. Um, well, so thank you. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And thanks for the kind words. I'm, I'm very proud of uh, um, what my, you know, grandfather and great uncle and so many members of my family um, have been able to accomplish. So for, you know, my, my grandfather is Robert Kennedy, who was served as attorney general in the United States. Um, you know, I, you know, and, um, my father was in Congress, my twin brother that was served in Congress um, and lots of other members of my family. And I think it's it's a great honor. And I think that, you know, helps me at least always want to find, um, you know, find areas where we can make a difference, you know, um, and that, you know, even if you're in the private sector, you know, what you do day to day should be about, you know, not only, you know, private sector and, you know, uh, corporation and business need to make money, but also really being thoughtful about, you know, how those businesses impact the broader community and can make a positive difference. And so I think, you know, as we look for partnerships um, overseas and partners like that, you know, we strive to ensure and I strive to ensure that those, those live up to those ideals, um, that there's going to be, you know, good partners that treat their workers well, that um, want to have positive impacts in their communities and locally and those sorts of things. I hope to see you in Tbilisi quite soon. At the same time, you are still in the private sector so far after you held so much senior positions. And uh, I want just to update our viewers and followers that uh, Matt Kennedy was, uh, he has just mentioned about only about uh, Department of Commerce, but it was, he was a part of White, White House administration. Uh, it was, he was also a part of uh, Department of Treasury very close engagement with OPIC and Export Import Bank. So, Matt, uh, 
proud of you and uh, great to have you on board. And thank you so much for this interview. Forbes really appreciates this. Uh, thank, thank you very much for the time and look forward to, to meeting on my next in person on my next trip to Georgia. So appreciate it. Definitely. Thank you. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Progressive Black Georgia has presented two new independent supervisory board members at its head office. Nino Dadunashvili and Teona Makalatia have joined the supervisory board, which is chaired by Marcel Zeitinger alongside the other members. It's important to know that with this appointment, the number of women on the bank supervisory board has now risen to 50%, resulting in a more equitable gender balance. Procreative Bank Georgia is part of the international procreative group, which is mainly represented in the Eastern European countries with transition economies as well as in Germany. I hope they will contribute uh, with their expertise in, in their respective uh, fields, um, also with their knowledge on the domestic market and of course give us always a critical eye. Uh, on, on our operations, but also to have good discussion with us in the supervisory board and in the different committees that we are having. Obviously, now still we are in the pandemic, um, which is, I think, difficult for all of us, but we have been working our way through it and we have been working closely with our existing business clients and further um, attracting and um, having new corporations with businesses in Georgia. Um, I think Georgia has been on a high growth track in, in the last years. Um, I would say not, not maybe everything of it is sustainable, but um, in general it's a very, very positive development and we hope that this will continue in the future as well. Do you know how many sunny days we have in Georgia during the year? Due to the geographical location of our country, solar radiation is rather high. In most regions of the country, there are approximately 218 sunny days. It means that Georgia has really good potential for growing the solar energy system. Besides, according to the 10-year network development plan of Georgia for 2031, the total installed capacity for solar power plants in Georgia will grow to 520 megawatts. That's just a plan. In reality, we have only micro projects based on a net metering system. All the challenges that our country faces in terms of developing solar energy we covered with Tornike Darjania, the chief of Helios Energy Georgia. This is a solar energy company established in 2017. Thank you for your time, first of all. And SIC small uh, solar energy system projects is still growing in Georgia, maybe step by step, but it's still growing. What can you say about your company? What kind of projects are you working on for now? Uh, firstly, thanks for inviting me. Uh, our company Helios Energy Georgia uh, was established in 2017 and we developed, uh, let's say, slowly in that from the very beginning. And uh, we had this year like a boost, boost time uh, because this solar business was boosted because of the one reason. The reason was the increase of the electricity prices. Terry. And uh, if we compare to the um, prices which we had last year, for example, there is a, uh, about 70% difference. And uh, for sure now the consumers, end consumers, and also all the, all the uh, consumers which consume the electricity are interested to have their own generation. Um, because uh, everybody knows now that the electricity price will increase in future. Uh, and uh, so they would like to have their own uh, uh, type of the generation, yeah? their own electricity, let's say. And the solar energy is the one of the best uh, options because um, you don't need, you can install it in, on, on your site. So when, where, where you have factory or where you have household and so on. So this was um, uh, the development of also for, for our company because we, uh, we have, uh, this year we have about 500% uh, uh, growth. So in, in comparison with the, with the last years. So we see that there is a market and the market is growing and uh, this is very good for development and also not, for, not only for the solar 
energy development, but also for other sources of the renewable energy. How can you assess solar energy potential in Georgia and um, how attractive is it uh, for investors, for you and for your uh, kind of companies as well? Yeah, that's a good question because um, um, we, we say in Georgia that the Georgia is uh, mostly for the hydropower plants right. and we have a very big potential in the hydro. But uh, we have also a very big potential in the wind energy and also in solar energy. And I would also mention the geothermic energy, yeah, which, which uh, people forget, forget about it. But we have these sources of the energy. Uh, but just talking about the solar, solar energy, to compare with the European countries, the average uh, annual irradiation in European countries, for example, let's say, take Germany, is about 1,000 uh, kilowatts per square meter. In Georgia, we have higher? In Georgia, we have 30 percent mere. We have uh, sometimes more than 30 percent. We have 1,300, 1,400. Also, we have sunny days also in winter, yeah, because when when there is a talk, so we we do not have we don't have sun, sunny days in in, in uh, winter. It's not reality. We have even now today was very sunny day, and uh, that's why solar even works in in winter. And um, because of that, uh, the price, the invested uh, amount, and also the payback amount, yeah, the, these are uh, about in, in comparison with each other are about uh, five, six, seven years depended on which type of the solar PV system we install. Is it a household or is, is it a big, big solar PV station? So I would say that generally it has a big potential, very big potential uh, also in, uh, in our country. In our region, for example, in Armenia, uh, I mentioned always that, that they are also very further developed than we are in Ukraine, in Azerbaijan, it tries also to develop solar potential and even in Russia <laughs> because in Russia they have a very um, limited sunny days let's say in, mostly in winter so in our region solar uh, generation solar PV plants are developing and the, the trend is going up and up and it, 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 it's it's too welcome just well, what can you say about availability of uh, a net metering system uh, for households, first of all? And also, what's your impression about uh, public awareness towards uh, renewable energy system in Georgia? Firstly, I would say what's net, net metering, yeah, because because yeah, net metering does it doesn't mean it's, it's a term. It's it's a, somehow the Georgian term. Yeah, we call it net metering. Net metering means that we can feed into the grid uh, the electricity which, uh, which we do not consume that time of the generation. And when we need it, for example, where is, when there is no sun, for example, evening or uh, in uh, the days without sun. Yeah, we can no, bring electricity We can bring electricity the back, back to them, back to our uh, consumption. And um, the interesting is that um, the net metering works with the model that you give one kilowatt hour and you get back one kilowatt hour for free. This is this is the main idea, main idea be behind this, and that's why is this model interesting? Yeah, because uh, this is one to one business, and for households it, it works well. But in Georgia, we have uh, the different prices, so electricity prices for household pays less for one kilowatt hour than a business. Just to mention the, the numbers, uh, when household pays about 22 tetri, 23, 26 tetri, yeah, the business pays 33 tetri. So the difference is uh, quite huge. And that's why it's worse for business more to, uh, to install the solar PV station or other generation source than for households. Now we are mostly focused on installing the solar PV stations for business, so for factories, for, uh, for any kind of business uh, which have uh, now the, uh, the price of electricity more than 30 tetri. For them it's, it's worse because as I, as I said, uh, the payback period is about from, from five 
till seven years. And what we have also in Georgia, we have the, uh, the credit lines because the banks are also involved, bank and also leasing companies are also involved in this process. They have also the products they offer this to clients. And so you don't need your own sources. So you can just go to the bank or leasing company and to get the project financed. And this is very, very good opportunity. And in some cases, so banks are following to the system. Banks right? are following to this trend and to this development. And also we have uh, in Georgia, mm, uh, the, uh, some s th this kind of incentive. We have a program made in Georgia, uh, right. or just produce in Georgia, yeah. and the produce in Georgia. This program is uh, supporting also the solar PV stations, and they pay your annual interest. So when you go to bank, and for example, you have to pay about uh, uh, seventeen percent annual interest. So they finance about 11%. So you have to pay only 6% to the, to the bank. And that's also a very, very good um, support mechanism so for, for that business. So what can you say about uh, uh, flexibility of this net metering system? What needs to be changed in net metering system? What's your uh, mind? Uh, I would say that the net metering system which we had Till now, it was um, it was a very good model. I, even I would say that we we can install up to 500 kilowatt uh, uh, installed. In the very beginning, it was it was 100. It was up to 100. Up to 100. And then we it, it was changed to 500. And uh, there are very rare countries which have the similar regulation because we wanted to develop uh, the this micro generation direction in Georgia. That's why it was uh, it was said that let's let's do 500, and it worked well. Even we have so-called virtual virtual net metering, and this means that you can have your generation at another place, and you can get your genera generated electricity uh, at another place. So without paying this uh, uh, electricity transmission costs. And this is also a in, in good inception yeah, for, for, for that. Uh, but now we are in that time that the electricity market changes. So we are in a reform process. And we have a challenge now for net metering system that we can somehow keep this model. So the benefits of this model, ju just what I said, this one-to-one -one, um, principle yeah? yeah, that we can keep this uh, because the, the 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 biggest benefit yeah is this is just one to one um, uh, yeah exchange for both of sides. Yeah, yeah for both sides it's just one to one exchange for your Alex what you what you feed in what you get just one to one so we are now in the reform time and we work together with the tariff commission that uh, that we keep these benefits. So what more incentives would you like to see in Georgia? Should, I, on your should, should I be realistic or should I, uh, can I dream? <laughs> can I dream? So we, what we, um, what other countries do? Let's, let's just not, not dream about something uh, yeah. unrealistic, our neighbors, yeah? They have, for example, the green, green tariff, yeah? They give also a premium tariff uh, it doesn't matter what you call the just just they when you feed into the grid they give you money and this is and they also in this model they not just give you the money for the electricity what, what, what you produce they say that I will pay this money 10 years 15 years 20 years this is for example in Germany the model they have there so they say okay we, we have a green tariff produce energy we will pay for that we do not have this kind of the system. And another, uh, another model is uh, tax regulations. For example, we pay for VAT for the imported um, products, for solar panels, for inverters. We pay uh, VAT. In some countries, they do not pay VAT. For example, in Armenia, they don't, do not pay VAT. In Ukraine, they do not pay VAT for that. This is just to, how to say, just to push the market market and push the development that it uh, uh, it grows quickly because we have um, 
demand of the electricity and each year every year it grows and grows and grows we need more energy and that's why we have to build more more generation um, catch up to catch this catch up, demand catch up this demand yeah that's the point and uh, yeah for example the another point could be the tax regulations yeah that somehow this or also in some countries they have green certificates yeah and the green certificate means that the, if the company or factory is completely green it produces its own green energy and it's uh, mm, uh, how to say uh, the this carbonation level is too low in the production or some kind of this they get this green certificate and this green certificate means that they have some kind of the, um, some tax uh, uh, yeah, pay less tax or this kind of um, incentives, incentives they, yeah. they get for that. When we are talking about uh, solar power plants in Georgia we still do not have big power plants. Now there are a lot of projects uh, on paper let's say but uh, not in reality so what's the reason what's the main obstacles for investors yeah you're right so we have the projects on paper and uh, I, I know some paper um, projects they are on paper almost uh, six uh, seven years and they we, we cannot build them the the very first uh, problem was the, that uh, we, we do not have what I mentioned already we do not have this tariff so let's say the green green tariff or we do not have PPAs we we said in 2000 uh, real e encouragement mechanism yeah, yeah yeah so this is in every country so this is a real encouraged mechanism they say that, okay I will pay you this kind of amount and you can build and provide us energy you know we do not have this uh, the last uh, model, what, what I remember was that we, we were said that we could build a solar PV station and could get about six dollar cents per kilowatt hour but only eight months in a year. And uh, the in, in, in uh, summer where we have, so the summer months, this was June, July, uh, uh, August, uh, we August have high generation. Yeah, we have high generation, and we, if we do not get so, um, uh, if we were not paid for that amount, so this was not interesting. That's why no one installed before that. After that, we said so we do not have PPAs. Even this model was cancelled, and now the only opportunity what we have is the the market. market. So on market, we have another problem. <laughs> another problem is that uh, we cannot anticipate the generation of the solar uh, solar because our generation is not so you cannot anticipate how the sun will shine tomorrow or the same problem ha has also the wind energy you can predict yes this kind of yeah well, you cannot predict so it's it's very difficult to predict in some days for uh, in summer it's easier because you have more sunny days and you can predict the gener your generation but in uh, autumn, winter, it's, it's almost impossible how the day and sunshine will, will look like. Yeah? This is a problem and I think that in, in to solve this problem we have just to take uh, models of other countries. The similar models how they do in other countries yeah? because we, do not, we don't need to somehow um, reinvent uh, a new model. So we have to just take... Adjust. Adjust, yeah. This is the first one, and the another one uh, is also, uh, uh, the same problem related how much I will get paid, <laughs> how, I will, how I will get paid. This is a problem, yeah, generally. And uh, we have this premium, or how it's called, this premium tar tariff that they give you this uh, 1.5 cent addi right. additional, so add on on how, how what, what you get maximum. paid. Yeah, this is a maximum. And uh, everyone says, and also investors say that this is not enough. So because to our calculations, uh, one kilowatt should be paid for about six cents, six six point five, maybe not less than five point five cent per kilowatt hour. That it could be interesting 
for the investor. Energy exchange market postponed one more time. So let's see what yeah, happens. Let's see what happens next. Let's see. <laughs> and back to your projects. Uh, who is your main customer for today? What can you say? Our main customers are factories, business. Uh, well, because of prices, you because mentioned. of price, I, I mentioned NDB. I cannot even say so. Uh, hotels, factories, what which produce are no metal uh, factories which produce some plastics, papers, uh, what else? So we have also uh, the universities. They consume also energy and uh, everybody so the big big businesses let's say i cannot say that the one one is, is more so so let's say that the big big business is now our main 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 uh, target target yeah uh, what i said everybody needs energy and the problem and the fear they face is that everybody has seen that the one day can just stay uh, and it happened also when, they, when the new year came, yeah, when, when everybody woke up <laughs> and the price increase was about 70 percent. And uh, they have seen this development and now nobody has, a, has uh, today a illusion that uh, the electricity price will stay the same, it's impossible. We have in Georgia also a very big problem, these are miners who mine the, the Bitcoin or Ethereum and um, this is also a big problem. So we are challenged and because of that people now realize we are challenged and we have to, we need more, more generation. That's why... And it needs some kind of answer from your side Yeah, and your it needs from well. answer from our side, solutions. Yeah. yeah, so based on the situation you've just described, what's your plan for next year? Uh, this year we built about uh, 4 megawatts, so installed capacity. And uh, next year is our uh, aim is to, to double the... So let's... let's uh, we would like to build more and more and we would like also to go in some other diet, no, not just do the solar, but also go to geothermical. other... Geothermical? Geothermical, also heat pump technology is very important now in its development because, because of, the, uh, from, uh, of the reason that the, we see that the gas, gas prices, go, they go so high and the heat pumps and this, the new technologies of the heating and cooling, this, this is the future and we, we have to start in Georgia this development because what I, what I see in, in Germany, in Europe, that uh, uh, the new houses, so new new households, yeah, everyone installs only new heat buildings. pumps. New buildings. They have only heat pumps and even they, the, the, the government pays uh, about up to 50% 50, 50 of the technology, they finance up to 50% of the technology uh, to, to help, to support this. Uh, I don't think we can afford that. We, we can, can afford, you know why? You, you, you think that the Germany has in this regard more money than we have? They finance it because they, if, if this technology works, yeah, then you do not consume uh, gas. And if you do not go consume gas, this money, what we pay to our neighbors for gas, this stays in our country. And let's finance this with this money, the technologies, not just send it to our neighbors because it will bring nothing to us. Thank you for your time. It was really an interesting talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. More business news, especially for you, if you want to know how many restaurants is going to open McDonald's in Georgia, how it looks like Georgian KV's export capacity also, what kinds of plans do Georgian tea company might ahead for the next year, and many more interesting news are waiting for you, prepared by Natia Taktakishvili. Over 500,000 fir trees are sold annually in Germany. Geneva Bunashuli, project planning and development manager at Fir Trees Foundation, told BMG. Geneva Bunashuli explains that 90% out of 45 million fir trees on the market are from Russia region. She notes that price of one fir tree ranges within 35-40 euros. McDonald's Georgia plans to open three branches in 2022. Tengis Kapanadze, general director of the company, told BMG. 
According to him, new branches will be opened in Isani, Rustawi Highway and Tbilisi Airport. The investment amount totals to 21 million jewelry. McDonald's Georgia currently operates 16 branches throughout the country. A floating hot chalet on the lake Shaori in Russia is closing down temporarily. The floating hut will resume operating from spring, as company's founder Vahtan Giyashvili says the climatic conditions are among the reasons. Floating hut launched with an investment of 40,000 lari in 2022 attracted the attention of foreign and local tourists in its first year, according to Vahtan Giyashvili, to work with full capacity during the summer months. Since May, the cottage has received a total of 220 guests, of which about 70% via foreigners or 30% via local tourists. It should be noted that price for two persons per night totals to 400 J lari. Tea producing company Chayrina expands and adds tea for toddlers from 2022. As Salome Miminoshvili, co-founder of the company, told BMG, the company will invest 100,000 USD in the expansion. Toddlers tea will combine berry, blueberry and seasonal food flavored tea with will be made from Georgian bureau materials. We will use Georgian tea in the production for the first time because we make all 12 varieties with Asian raw materials, explains Salome Miminoshvili. Georgian company Chairin was founded in 2020 by Georgian and Singaporean partners. The company offers customers 12 types of tea made from the highest quality Asian raw materials, including both herbal and popular Asian teas. Chairin products are sold in the company's online store. Company Sisori Copy declares that the company has increased product price by 30% due to the sharp growth of raw materials on the international market from 2021. As Tim Sisori told BMG, the growth amounted to 80% on the international market. The company managed to keep profitability at the expense of price increase. Sisori Coffee is operating on the market since 2016. The company imports raw coffee beans from several countries. Coffee Lab has 20% increase in the direction of coffee delivery, while the growth has made up 100% regarding the cafe bar. Giorgi Ivaziani, the founder of Co Coffee Lab, told BMG. According to him, the company has to increase prices slightly due to sharp growth of raw materials on the international market, but the company still managed to operate successfully. At the same time, the founder of the company declares that the delayed tourism and COVID regulations were the main problems for Coffee Lab due to which the cafe was not able to host as many customers as before. Coffee Lab operates in three directions. This include coffee shop, coffee grain supply to the companies and import of coffee machines. Georgian a tea producing company Mana will arrange new spaces near the enterprise in Saguramo. As Ekaterina Jagodnishvili, marketing and public relations manager of Mana, told BMG it will be an eco-friendly building with a tea museum, a tourist area and restaurant will be arranged. According to her, tourists often go to the Mana factory and taste tea because of the high interest the company decided to arrange this space. At the moment, active works are underway on the site and construction of a certain part will be completed by 2022. As for the volume of investment, according to Ekaterina Jakotnishvili, at this stage they are negotiating with partners, therefore it's difficult to name the exact numbers. Georgian National Dessert Producing Company Pelamushita opened a new branch on Armashanebeli Avenue. As Nina Gogoladze, the founder of Pelamushita, told BMG, the product will be manufactured on the spot and the facility will offer customers delivery services as well. The company Pelamushita, which employs a total of 13 people, will open more branches throughout Bilisi in the near future and plans to develop in the regions as well. Expensive raw materials will be the main challenge for Mayama in 2022. General Director of Mayama, Luca Kapanadze, told BMG. According to him, all products price got expensive on the international market. Company imports raw materials from about 18 countries. Despite this fact, Mayama does not consider the price increase for coffee and will try to offset with increased production. Company Mayama increased the number of employees from 60 to 400 in 2021, despite the pandemic. In addition, the company opened new branches in Batumi and Kutaisi. And time to present another Georgian brand and its business story. This is a well-known company, Kampa, that produces non-alcoholic beverages, different kinds of juices. The factory is located in Saguramo, and the production line covers not only Georgian market, but foreign markets as well. This is made in Georgia. Salome Chipashul tells you more.
Evar Sandro Buadze, compañía Campas, director. The idea came about around 2006, when construction of the factory began. It lasted for about a year and a half to two years. Then we appeared on the market. From the very beginning, we had introduced aseptic technology, which was quite a new word and concept in Georgia at the time. We have been actively present in the market since 2009. Approximately one hectare is the land area. Buildings are somewhere around 3,500 square meters. $2.5 million is the initial investment amount that we started with. Our main brand is Gampa. This is our premium line of products, which comes in liter and 200 millimeter packages. We have about 12 different flavors. We also have the brand Treni, which is a line of nectars. In the middle price segment, we also have the drinks and the juice price segment with the addition of vitamins. Kampa prices for one liter packaging ranges from 4 lari and 80 tetri to 5 lari. The prices for Chveni range from 3 lari and 20 tetri and 3 lari and 30 tetri. Another product of ours, Frutata, ranges from 2 lari to 2 lari and 20 tetri. We produce about 3 million liters of juice per year. Exports have increased significantly. According to today's data, somewhere around 60% is the local market, 40% comes in exports. We have China, Russia, Azerbaijan, the United States, and Emirates on the list of export countries. We have just added Israel. This year, we have set up a new glass tap line to enter the market with new products. This is a cold tea that will be made not from the extract, but from the real local, real tea leaves with less sugar. We try to buy this tea from small and medium producers. Initially, there will be four flavors, black tea with peach, white tea with blueberry flavor, Unlung, this is a semi-oxidized tea, and Grubis with cream and vanilla. This brand is called Mosui and will appear on the store shelves in about a month. In addition, we plan to produce direct squeezing juices in glass containers, which were not presented in our product list before. We also plan to develop bio and organic directions. Before we say goodbye, we will tell you about a new edition of Forbes Georgia's December issue, Unite's interesting profiles, thought leader analysis, rankings, leaderboards, and many more. You have a chance to read another interesting cover story about Pata Gazzazza as the general director of TBC Insurance. Maria Madamia will give you details. TBC Insurance has been operating in the Georgian market for five years now and during this time it uh, has managed to become an institutionalized company, becoming a market maker. The main story of the December issue of Forbes uh, Georgia is dedicated to TBC Insurance and its CEO Badagadzadze and as for the summing up of the past five years in numbers it looks something like this. Uh, the premium attracted to exceeds uh, 308 million. There are more than 103 million uh, premium uh, for auto insurance and more than 91 million for life insurance premiums. TBC Insurance is the undisputed leader in the retail market, so that is not all. What will be the next stage? Details can be found in the December issue of Forbes Georgia. In the new December issue of Forbes, the world's leading business magazine, you will read The best seller rating of 2020 in Georgia is leader as the book Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck and the most profitable Georgian publishing house is Palitra L. What is the largest supermarket chain in the country? Shotat Qeshelashvili compiled the rating according to the indicators of the growing sector and the published audited reports. The number one player, Carrefour, was replaced by Nicora Libre supermarket chains. In the new issue, we also calculated the rankings of Georgian banks according to the profit of 2021. One million citizens of Georgia will spin the last free spin in the few months and will say goodbye to gambling for a long time. You can read more about the regulations of the gambling industry and the changed rules of the game in the column section of Forbes Georgia. Forbes Georgia also summed up results for the year for Liberty Bank in an interview with the company CFO Vat Obabunashvili. David Narmania tells us about the competition law and energy in the author's column. In the interview, he answers the main question, what was 2021 like for the Georgian energy sector? 
in the new issue of Forbes, Georgia this month, you will also meet the company of the editor-in-chief, Georgi Sakaze, with the pandemic nobody effect. We will tell you about the pop's uh, corruption problem, so we uh, consider how much it cost the Georgian um, government to fight COVID and also how to uh, become a small entrepreneur and pay only 1% income tax. So with Forbes, a century experienced guide to business and economics. Well, that's all for today. Follow us on BM.G and Forbes.G till Sunday. The Checkpoint is presented by GM Pharma, the first international multinational pharmaceutical company in Georgia. GM Pharma, to serve those who need it most.